but I'm the high priest. I'm the czar of the healing power of pets. Hi, I'm Brilliant, your host for this show. I know that I'm incredibly blessed. As the son of self-made billionaires, I've seen the high price some people pay for success, and I've learned that money really can't buy happiness. But I've also had the good fortune to learn directly from many of the world's leading teachers. If you're ready to be, do, have, and give more, this podcast is for you. Uh, Today, my guest is Edward T. Cragen, MD. He's a cancer specialist, the first Mayo Clinic doctor board certified in hospice and palliative medicine. Dr. Ed has authored over 500 scientific papers. He's given more than a thousand presentations throughout the world. He's written two books, How Not to Be My Patient, A Physician's Secrets for Staying Healthy and Surviving Any Diagnosis, and Farewell vital end-of-life questions with candid answers from a leading palliative and hospice physician. Having watched my dad pass from many lifestyle or highly treatable, if not preventable diseases, I wanted to see what I could learn and share from Dr. Ed. In this interview, we talk about the dying process, how to be a good caregiver, or how to interact with those who are in their last days or months. We talk about how to care for yourself if you find yourself in the role of caregiver. You can learn more about Dr. Ed and his work by visiting askdred.com. I hope you enjoy and benefit from this conversation with my new friend, Dr. Ed. Dr. Ed, welcome to the School for Good Living. Thank you. Thank you. Will you tell me, please, what's life about? Life is about making the day a little better for some troubled soul especially those of us who do have privilege, who do have position, that's not enough. It's not enough to have the big car, the lakeside cabin, the BMW. Somehow those gifts need to be shared because then it will come back to us, especially today Mm. when COVID-19 has stripped bare the screaming inequities of healthcare, the screaming inequities of opportunities. So we really have a responsibility to somehow open a door for someone that may be a digital door, it may be a physical door, but somehow we have been called to make it better for somebody else. And what's really cool, you make it better and they don't know it. Mm. Yeah. I've, I've heard it said before that true charity is anonymous and uh, what you're saying there uh, kind of seems. In yes. Line with that. Yes. So wonderful. Well, Dr. Ed, part of why I'm really interested to talk with you is that I know you have an incredible life experience and you have been at the bedside of more than 40,000 patients who were on their way out of this world. And I wonder, what have you learned in your time dealing with so many people over so many years? Everybody has a story. Everybody has a drama. And at the bedside, there have been overwhelmingly consistent themes. And the theme is regrets, remorse, and missed opportunities. Mm. No one ever talks about their 403B, their 529, their 401K, the letter from the CEO acknowledging that they were the leader in sales, but it was regrets and remorse. And those are the same themes that I hear when I play the piano in the lobby of the Mayo Clinic. Mm -hmm. We have the finest piano in the world called the Busendorfer. And I try to play a couple of nights a week for 45 minutes. And I hear the same stories. I was as good as Elton John, Billy Joel, but then something happened. And that's what I hear at the bedside. What I don't hear is people taking ownership or responsibility for their misadventures. Mm. I hear unconnected dots. I hear folders which have not been closed. I hear unfinished business, the prodigal son who's never connected, Mm -hmm. the daughter who had an unfortunate relationship 
and we've never picked up the horn to make amends. Mm. A consistent theme, regardless of the belief system, regardless of the faith system. Mm. But no acknowledgement of the role that we played in the messes that we've created. Yeah. This path is uh, one that I know you began maybe without knowing at a young age. Uh, yes. And of course, this is true for all of us. You know, your parents or caregivers played a big role in that. But uh, you had some some early experiences that that I think set you on this course. Will you talk about how did you how did you come to the work you're now doing? I'm often asked that question, brilliant. And it began in a poverty-stricken hamlet in Ireland, the Republic of Ireland. The South is the Republic. The six counties are the North. That's the Protestants in general. That's Ulster. And my grandmother was the oldest of 11 children. And one night, her parents came to her. Her name was Mary. The name of the town was Mechaconner. Still remember it. And they said, Mary, at dawn, there's going to be a wagon at the end of the lane, a horse-drawn wagon. And you can get in that wagon. You're 11 years old now. You can get in that wagon and go to Cove. Cove is the harbor of Cork on the southern tip of Ireland for which the immigrants left. You can get in that wagon and go to America where the death rate on the ship was 30%. This is crossing the Atlantic in April. She never saw the light of day. She lost probably 15% of her body weight. And she was told by her parents, if you don't take that trip, you will die in Ireland because of tuberculosis called consumption, or you will die because of the uh, issues with, with Great Britain. So she made a decision in the middle of the night, knowing she would never see her parents again. So think about that. She's dumped on Ellis Island like a sack of potatoes. Everything she owned was in a pillowcase. She spoke not a word of English. She spoke Irish. She married my grandfather, who was a prominent jockey. Because of alcoholism, he lost his trade. I live with them because my parents were alcoholics. And we moved into a rooming house in Newark, New Jersey. And this is where my story started. On the second floor, there was a room facing the street that was rented out to a Polish immigrant that I remember as if it were yesterday. His name was John Grabowski. And he had cancer of the rectum. Cancer of the rectum in the 1950s was a dreadful condition. Treatments were brutal, non-effective. And my job as an eight-year-old was to come home from school and change the appliance, which collected the waste from his intestines twice a day. Wow. 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 I knew this was the path I would follow. I can't make this up. This was kind of the Oprah stuff. But whether this was a guardian angel, whomever, that started me on the path of end of life. Never looked back. No regrets. It was a gift not to have a distraction. Because when you grow up in Newark, New Jersey, everyone wants to play for the Yankees or, Lord forbid, the Knicks. (laughs) (laughs) but this was a path for which i've been profoundly grateful Mm -hmm. wow from the time you were eight years old yes that's amazing so undergraduate work had the focus for medicine internal medicine oncology national cancer there was no deviation whatsoever i had a gps of the soul that needed to be honored and acknowledged. Now that's something that I think many people wish they had, or they don't believe they, you know, they don't believe they do, or or they, 
they think even if, if it's in there, you know, maybe the battery's dead or they don't know how to turn it on. This whole idea of a GPS for the soul, what do you, what do you say to people who maybe haven't activated theirs yet? How can they do it? I'm smiling because I've given a number of commencement addresses. And what the audience is expecting to hear, we've all been there, follow your dreams. Yep. Okay? That's a recipe for oblivion. Mm. Because when you're 17, you don't even know what day it is. You don't know <laughs> right. what your dreams are. Yep. And I'm reminded of the commencement address at Stanford University by Steve Jobs. This is a classic. And he talks about connecting the dots, that everyone has an intrinsic curiosity about something. Mm -hmm. Nurture that curiosity, get real good at it. Don't be common. Don't be discouraged. And that will leave you to the promised land. Mm -hmm. And if you look at every person of prominence, however you may be define them, they had a curiosity about something. Yo-Yo Ma, the cellist, had a curiosity about music. Elvis Presley, loading trucks in Tupelo, Mississippi, had a curiosity about music. But you need someone to open that door and tell you how good you are. And for Elvis, it was Colonel Tom Parker. So every person of greatness has had a pole star directing them down the road. Because without that pole star, you ain't going to go the distance. You're going to become distracted. And the boulevard of broken dreams is littered by the individuals who became distracted by all sorts of issues that we could talk two hours about. Yeah. Well, I love what you're saying about this intrinsic curiosity where sometimes passion can feel daunting. What if I have so many, or what if I just don't know what it is, but this idea of, look, you're, you're curious about something, you know, honor that. I, I really like that. So awesome. Let me ask you, let me turn the conversation to a discussion about your book, Farewell. Vital yes. end of life questions with candid answers from a leading palliative and hospice physician. Yes. Who did you write this book for and why? I wrote this for every patient and every family that needs to be empowered. That transition from life to death doesn't open itself for a second chance. There's no do over. There's no dress rehearsal. Mm -hmm. Most of the books which had been written focused on the emotional and psychiatric community. We all remember Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, a wonderful physician from the University of Chicago in the 1960s. And she started the conversation about end of life. Unfortunately, the conversation was corrupted and it was not correct. She talked about the stages of death and dying, denial, anger, bargaining, acceptance. And many of us believe that this was an orderly transformation from denial to bargaining to depression, but it's not. But we now know that this is a journey. This is a process. And if we don't know what's going on, we're going to become bewildered and make some major mistakes. Mm. The other dimension of the book that very few people talked about was the importance of prudent financial planning at the end of life, which most of us do not do adequately. And then we leave a existential psychic catastrophe that the grieving widow or widower are saddled with for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that I've seen, right? And you write that we are a death-denying culture. Yes. What do, by, what do you mean by that? 
Look at the commercials. Every woman is a size four with straight teeth and a 24 inch waist. We don't want to think about dying. The concept of advanced directives is anathema to most individuals. And simplistically, advanced directives dictates who do we want to speak for us if we can't speak for ourselves? And what aggressive management do we want if we can't speak for ourselves? So every couple of years, my wife and I, Peggy, my wife, my best friend, my running partner, we sit down with our attorneys to make it crystal clear that there is no misunderstanding, especially in the time of COVID. Mm -hmm. So we revised our advanced directive. If I'm not better and I have COVID and we hit 30 days, I do not want any aggressive management. I want my care to be de-escalated because I would never put my family through what many of us put our families through at end of life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this, um, this thing about being a death denying culture really resonates with me where a few months ago, uh, this is about a year ago, I suppose, uh, I'm as part of a group of entrepreneurs I belong to, we, we took a retreat and we had uh, discussions planned. And one of them was to write and share our own obituary. Yes, yes, yes. And I was the one who proposed it. And when it came time to actually do it, I didn't do it. Like, I don't know what it was. I sat down in front of the keyboard, you know, in computer, but I just, I, like, I, I couldn't bring myself to do it. So I've experienced this firsthand and having watched my dad pass, you know, just over a decade ago now, it's actually been 12 years this month as we're recording this. I've seen, uh, you know, the resistance to really looking at that for myself. I've seen the difficulty of going through it, but the importance, you know, the importance of it. And you talk about this advanced directive, uh, you talk about some other documents that are important for us or other things that are important for us to do. And maybe this is in the context of life completion, or maybe that's something different, but I want to explore with you these two things. One is what do you mean by the term life completion? And the other thing is what are some of the most common I would, I would almost say mistakes or things that we don't do that we could or should do to make this easier for ourselves and those we love. Okay, let's go back to the second question first. Okay. About five years ago, I was called by a woman whom I had known somewhat socially. Mm -hmm. Her husband had been <laughs> recently diagnosed with cancer of the pancreas which has the survival under most circumstances of a short number of months. The patient was an MBA and a CPA, went to the Wharton School of Finance in Philadelphia. So he was a thoroughbred and was a major leader in the medical community, a power broker. Mm -hmm. So I visited them because they didn't live terribly far. And 80% of what we do is showing up. Woody Allen said that 80% is showing up. So I listened to his concerns. And as we were winding down, I said, so and so, have you taken care of the financial stuff? Because as your energy fades, the last thing you want to do is dealing with an estate attorney and some CPA someplace. Oh, sure, Ed, no problems. Everything's done no problems. He dies. Nothing was done. Wow. Zero. And I would see his wife occasionally at a, so a social function. She would take me aside and she said, you know, Ed, I have been in a fog for three years ever since my husband died in a total fog. I couldn't put two and two together. He did nothing financially to ease the burden. So three to five years later, every month or so, she gets a bill, a receipt, an invoice about something that he did not care for. So there's that dagger in the soul reminding her with some bitterness, he did not do his homework. So when my, my wife and I visit with this armada of high price characters, mm -hmm. 
We left the meeting. I said, okay, I want one phone number, one phone number that Peggy calls. Just pick up the phone. Who does she call to start this process of resolution? Because most people don't have any concept of this. Wills, yeah. trusts, estates, who gets what? Mm -hmm. Families, by definition, even in Minnesota, are wickedly dysfunctional. <laughs> that seems pretty universal. Let me rephrase that. We have Lake Wobegon. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect, right? And you throw in grief. Yeah. You throw in stepchildren who don't even know each other. You throw in second marriages. You throw in different non-traditional relationships. Yeah. And then you throw in money and everything changes, especially mm -hmm. in a farming community where an acre of land in some states might be ten to $12,000. Mm -hmm. And many of the agricultural patients whom I have met did not do responsible end-of-life financial planning. Mm -hmm. So that is the answer to the second question. The first, kit, the first question is, there is an intrinsic need to finish tasks. There is, an, infinish, there is a, an intrinsic desire to connect the dots and close the folders. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, there's a sense of incompleteness. So what I hear from patients at end of life is to leave a legacy, mm -hmm. something. Maybe they participated in a clinical trial. Maybe they invested in a company, which is a legacy to their insights. Many individuals have a legacy of a sporting franchise, a stadium, or they developed a running shoe. But just to remember that they lived and that they died and they did something. Yeah. They simply are not anonymous. Yeah. And one thing that comes to mind for me here, you talk a little bit about is organ donation. Crucial. What a gift. And in my, my new wallet, I'm not promoting a product, but this is a, 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 this is a wallet called the Ridge. I have that same wallet. Is that the carbon fiber? Oh, of course. I love that wallet. <laughs> yeah. And I got this for Christmas and I thought I need this like I need a root canal, <laughs> especially when you gift that comes with a screwdriver. Yeah. Uh, so in here is my wallet. In here is my donor card. Mm. So that would be a gift that I can give to someone so that, that in a sense that that legacy is, is continued. Yeah. Yeah. This, this to me, it seems a bit of a paradox where, you know, we do seem, and we do seem to have this innate drive, this urge, this need to complete things, right. To close folders and, and bring resolution and, and mm -hmm. this kind of thing. And yet we resist sometimes facing these challenging yes, yes. issues of our own mm -hmm. mortality or, you know, something like that. And uh, I wonder if, if some people think, oh, you know, me, I'm not super wealthy. It doesn't apply to me. I don't need to have these, these wills and trusts and advanced healthcare directives and things like that in place. But I think, especially after reading your book, that's not the case, right? You don't have to have high net worth for these things to be important. Absolutely. Let me give you a classic example. Again, I'm just parroting brilliant what I paid people to teach me. Mm -hmm. Almost everyone has life insurance from a mm -hmm. company, from a foundation. Mm -hmm. So if we die, and if there's any CPAs out there, they'll probably send me a hate mail. But if we die, that life insurance in general is a highly taxable event. Mm -hmm. So let's suppose the life insurance is $100,000 and we're in a 30% tax bracket. I think that means 30%, 30,000 bucks is taken right out of that piggy bank to Uncle Sam. If that life insurance is part of an estate plan 
an irrevocable life insurance trust, the bulk of that life insurance is not taxable. Wow. So you have a piggy bank with another 30,000 bucks that you can donate to a school, to a team, to fund a Head Start program. That's cool. Yeah. So regardless of who we are, everyone has an estate plan. Some are more complicated than others. And we have an existential responsibility to be wise stewards of those resources and not give them away. Yeah. And, and I think about that story you shared just a, a few minutes ago about, you know, the widow who received these these documents, these invoices and so forth after the fact and received them with a sort of bitterness. Oh, you know, absolutely. Right. Where there's this sense of if we love, you know, those that that we're married to or dependent on us or related to us, uh, perhaps one way we could show that love is to be more thoughtful and deliberate in taking care of these things that might seem mundane or trivial while we're alive, but there will be people who survive us and there will be an impact. And I'll give you an example of a negative impact. There was a gentleman, he was about 50 who had lung cancer, serious problem. His survival was in a short number of months. He had been divorced, married a wonderful woman and she had three daughters. So he had three stepdaughters. He had three sons from his first marriage. He had inadequate estate planning. He died. Traditionally, the sons inherit the farm. His sons inherited nothing. The three stepdaughters and their husbands inherited the family farm. The bitterness, the rancor is still being adjudicated in the courts in upper Midwestern states. Mm -hmm. So I think if we're diagnosed with something serious, while we have a kernel of energy and focus and cognitive bandwidth, that next phone call needs to be the banker, the attorney, somebody that can cook the books. I'm from New Jersey originally, (laughs) cook the books, do the right thing so we can focus on relationships and our health. Yeah. Let me turn the conversation to an exploration of um, the dying process, right? Something that we'll all face uh, suddenly or in a, I think as my dad experienced this somewhat slow, long, slow decline. Yes. Yes. (laughs) But in your book, you write, let me walk you through the dying process so that there is some understanding of what to expect. Yes. Will you sketch that out for us? What is What should we expect from the dying process? When most patients are initially diagnosed with a potentially lethal problem, Lou Gehrig's disease, end-stage heart disease, cancer, typically the process starts with an overwhelming sense of bewilderment, forgetfulness, the cognitive purchasing power shrinks And this focus of the world goes to me as the patient. They become indifferent to the rest of the world. That tsunami's coming down the mountain. I don't care. I'm focused on me. Then there is a frenzy, a frenzy seeking out that czar, C-Z-A-R, that guru, that special person someplace that must have the key to the kingdom. That person with the Holy Grail, the Rosetta Stone, that's going to fix this. He has to be out there someplace. Many patients will spend a lot of money and a lot of time trying to find him, and they might be going to a place like a major medical center. So that part of the journey closes and then the reality hits home. My health is dwindling. So there becomes a shrinkage of their social circle. Rather than that entourage, your circle shrinks, spouse, partner, a pet, crucial 
during the dying process. We can talk about that later. Then there is a gradual folding down of interests. The biological processes go into slow motion. Less engagement, less focus, going to bed initially 10 o'clock, then nine, then 8.30, and then very little energy for the banal Monday discussions of life, politics, sports, relationships, the economy. More time sleeping. And the final ending is much like folding a tent or folding a parachute. It's not dramatic. It's not cataclysmic. It simply is a winding down. And most patients die with no one at the bedside. Most patients die when the faithful partner goes down the hall for a cup of coffee. Most patients die when the family goes across the streets of the motel to get a bite to eat and take a shower. Most patients die at night. Most horses die at night. So it's almost a way of protecting the family from the reality of that final passage. But there's also a message for visitors. Most visitors overstay their visit. The dying process uses a lot of energy. The only sacred property that the patient has is the bed. Don't come in and sit on the bed. Call ahead, call the nursing station. Ask if the patient is up for visitors. Ask if you can bring something. And be mindful that once what was funny is not funny anymore. And they don't have to have all the sort of details of your bankruptcy or your, or your second divorce. And be sure to leave before the patient asks you to leave. If the healthcare team comes into the room while you're, you're there, respectfully disengage because it ain't about you. Yeah, thank you for, for sketching that out. And, and I realize, you know, there's two, there's two aspects to this exploration in, in your book and, and in this conversation that are very useful. One is when it's us who's received the diagnosis or it's us who's going through the process. There's, yes. you know, again, you know, we'll all face that end of life, whether it's be, because of some specific disease or not. But the other is then when we're a caregiver or we're someone who's, you know, related to, to the person who's on his or her way out. And what you're saying now is, um, you know, it, for me, it's very sobering, right? Like there's something, I mean, life doesn't get more serious than, <laughs> than death. Yes. Right. As the end. And, and by the way, on that topic, I'm, I had, I think when my dad passed and then my brother died a few years later, uh, unexpectedly just before he was 45, that was really, I mean, I'd had grandparents die and other people I knew, but no one that was as close to me as that. And one of the things that I was so struck by is how absolute, right? It's not just, oh, I'll go ask him a question or, you know, see how they're doing. It wasn't, and I could find my mind looking for creative ways around something as if they were in a foreign country or, you know, they were otherwise inaccessible for a period, but it was just so like final, was really remarkable. You know, I, I'm smiling because you're a very good interviewer. <laughs> Thank and you. you've just articulated what every family member go, is the finality. Boom. It's over. There's no tomorrow. There's no mulligan. And every family member has this experience, although it's never quite so articulated. And I can recall spouses who would come to see me and they were embarrassed because they came home from the funeral and they were upset because the garden hose had not been turned off by their spouse. They were upset 
because the mortgage was not paid and she had to deal with this. They were upset because some legal issues were left unresolved. They were upset because they couldn't go to him to program their cell phone. One woman said to me, she was irate because he knew how to increase the font of her phone. She did. (laughs) And it's little things like that, that slowly drive us insane. But the finality of death can be crushing. And even when we know it's coming, we are never prepared. Never. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that you're talking about the, the, the irritations of the upsets. I, I experienced a bit of that even years after my brother was gone when, you know, we had a discussion at one time as a family and I, and I found myself angry. He wasn't there to be a part of it. <laughs> I'm like, I want his voice in this conversation years later, you know, but how silly is that to be? I mean, that's a judgment of myself, but how silly of me to be upset at a deceased brother for not being a part of it a discussion years later, (laughs) you know? A consistent theme, not quite so eloquently dissertated by most family members. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, something we all, we all face. So let me ask you about uh, preferences. You talk a lot in this book about honoring the dying person's preferences, how important. Yes. Yes. And something that often gets overlooked. My first wake up call to this phenomena occurred in the early 1970s. Vietnam was a scar on our collective consciousness. Tet was in the late sixties. I believe 55,000 of our troops were were killed during that conflict. And many communities of faith brought to the United States members of the Vietnamese community. Mm. And faith communities in Minnesota opened their doors to these people, especially after Saigon fell in the uh, middle 1970s. And I remember this patient as if it were yesterday And because of confidentiality, I won't mention his name, but it's funny. You don't forget these people. He was a combat veteran, and he had a gaping chest wall wound where you could see his heart beating. Wow. A tough gentleman. And part of his life before the war, he was a barber. And as he was dying, he had in place a catheter into his bladder, multiple intravenous lines for fluids. And he was getting, with all sincerity, the finest end-of-life care in the world at the Mayo Clinic. No apologies. The people providing care for his end-of-life were superstars. And the family was in a state of acute agitation. They were pacing the room. They were chanting. They had the equivalent of rosary beads. And I was the attending physician, and I had no concept of what was happening. But finally, a Buddhist minister came into the room. I said, Reverend, educate me. What's going on? He told me that in their faith system, the way that patient was when he died is the way he would be for eternity. Therefore, upon death, the catheter would be in place for eternity The multiple IVs would be in place for eternity. And he was a barber. For eternity, he needed a comb, scissors, and a mirror. Hmm. It was Minnesota, a thousand degrees below zero. It was February. He had a hospital gown. The social workers went to J.C. (laughs) Penney to bring gloves, galoshes, a hat, and a coat. So here he is dying in the intensive care unit with a hat, a coat, galoshes, and gloves. I've never had so many hugs and kisses from women from Vietnam. Wow. Because we acknowledged his wishes at end of life. In some belief systems, the deceased must be buried by sundown. 
most of us were not terribly aware of these rituals in certain faith systems. So we make darn sure now that we're educated about the final chapter activities for faith systems about which we're not well educated. Help me. And the, there's always a representative in the family of the clan who will gladly say, okay, in our system, here's what we need. We need incense. We need sage. And with some creative administrative manipulations, we can get it done. Oh. Yeah. And, and one of those other things, and you touched on it earlier, also was pets. That oh. course, animals aren't normally allowed in a hospital. Or family pets aren't allowed in. But sometimes at the end of life, it's one of the most important things and it requires, right? This kind of creative <laughs> approach. Will you talk about that? Um, now, not to be self-serving, but I'm the high priest. I'm the czar of the healing power of pets. Mm. And I had the privilege of writing a definitive peer review paper on this. And the data are overwhelming. If you hold that horse, if you groom that cat, if you stroke that dog, there's a surge of immunologic and endocrine hormones, which enhance life-sustaining biological processes. Endorphin, enkephalin, serotonin, oxytocin, prolactin. These are measurable. And my first experience with this took place 25 years ago. So this is the anniversary of that event. Attending physician, Rochester Methodist Hospital, we admitted a patient who was about 50, disheveled, unkempt. He had the stigmata of a hard life, a broken nose that was not set, facial scars, poor dentition, a rock hard mass behind his collarbone, fluid in his lungs, a liver that was like a rock filled with cancer. We didn't think he would make it through the night. Full court press, fluids, antibiotics, and by the way, no family member basically dropped off at the Methodist hospital. We asked him with whom he lived. And as his sensorium cleared, he says, I have to get home for Max. Now this was in the nineties. We had no sense of cultural sensitivity no sense of um, partnerships. We naively thought Max was a daughter, son, spouse. He says, give me my wallet. Now I'm getting chest pain. It's not cool to go through a patient's wallet. Yeah. <laughs> See, give me my wallet. So he gives me the wallet. It was not one of these wallets, leather. He says, I want to show you a picture. And the picture was a 90 pound German shepherd cross. Mm. biggest dog I ever saw in my life. That was Max. Max was the catalyst, the payload to get this gentleman home to spend his remaining time. Wow. So there's a healing power of pets that gives meaning and purpose and engagement to people's lives. And I'll be at a wonderful program on February 25th. It's called Fetch, F-E-T-C-H, Fetch 360. It's one of the largest virtual veterinary meetings in the world. Three-day deal, rock stars. And I have the opportunity, not that I'm a rock star, but to talk about COVID pets and the miracles that I've seen that pets bring to patients and families. Mm. Is, is this available to everyone or is this yeah, only oh, medical yes. professionals? Yes. Um, Fetch 360 and Dr. Adam Christman, C-H-R-I-S-T-M-A-N, is the digital impresario that somehow has pulled this off. Hmm. And I was going to be on an Instagram feed later today. And the gift that you bring to me is the digital familiarity with this. Frankly, I didn't know that you can have a live Instagram feed. Yeah, pretty cool. So, 
So, yes, very cool. Now, I got an email from him early this morning, nausea, vomiting, sick. Oh, no. So we talked about this. I said, you call me anytime, any date. Doesn't matter. We'll get it done. But not not when you're this sick. Mm -hmm. So fetch 360. And I'll be on uh, late one afternoon talking about COVID and pets and what this means to each of us. Cool. That's great. Uh, Something I'm really eager to ask you about is deathbed confessions. In your book, you write, my white coat becomes almost a priestly collar, the hospital room, a confessional, and that doctor patient interaction an opportunity to set the record straight. Right. It's true. This is the, yeah, the deathbed confessional. And usually it's not something dramatic. Mm -hmm. I robbed a bank. Like D.B. Cooper, I had a lot of money and I jumped out of a plane over Washington State. But it's the subtle things that gnaw the soul of people. I cheated my partner. He didn't know that we made a windfall because we sold X, Y, or Z. I was at a convention. Too much to drink. A moment of indiscretion. A moment that I'm embarrassed about tells me that. A moment of, why did I ever do that? What was I thinking of? So these are the kind of things that don't have a big legal implication, but it's the kind of thing that they need to make peace with. And there's a phenomenon called the Zignarik effect, Z-I-E-G-N-A-R-I-K, Zignarik. And this was described by a Lithuanian board psychologist in the 1920s. And she noticed that among waiters, when there were tabs that were still open, the waiters remembered everything the name of the liquor, the name of the divorce, how big the stake was. They remembered everything. There was an anxiety about a ticket that was not resolved. Once the ticket was resolved and they had the check and the tip, they couldn't remember what these folks ate. The Zig Norik effect. So likewise, if we hear a song and we don't quite know how it goes. We're going to get on Google and find the name of that song. Mm -hmm. We have to close the dots. We have to close the files or it consumes our bandwidth. So at the bedside, when there's unfinished business, people are not at peace. For example, daughters in prison, dad holds on with advanced cancer until her parole is up and she comes to the bedside Then the dots are connected and he can pass on. Everyone's heard these stories. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Is your experience that when, when patients, dying patients kind of confess, so to speak to you, that that's enough for them to close? Yes. Close that. Yes. And they don't expect to make an apology to that partner or to that wife. That's not part of the package, but the fact that they told another somewhat credential professional about their misadventure was enough to give them the psychic energy to go to the other side. Yeah. And I think that's so interesting. And it goes right along with something else that you talk about, about one of the major themes is I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. I forgive you. Crucial to somehow make amends. But if there's a contentious relationship Call ahead to make sure that it's okay for you to visit that patient. Mm -hmm. I've had circumstances where a gentleman was dying. The former partner shows up. It was a divorce that didn't go well. It was a divorce that was very public and very humiliating. Patients dying, the families at the bedside, and the disenfranchised spouse shows up. Not good. 
So if there's a contentious relationship, call ahead. Ask the nurse to ask the patient, is it okay if I stop by? If the nurse says no, end of story. Don't just show up. Yeah. May not be a good scene. You know, I'm just struck by how the people who probably most need to hear that are the ones least likely to actually hear it, <laughs> you know? Yes. And you can imagine the tension. Oh, if there yeah. were bad behaviors that are visible in public, not, not a good way to go out. Same way yeah. at a funeral. Let's say a wife dies. There were some issues with a previous relationship if it's a gentleman, he needs to somehow get a word to the family. Is it okay if I go to the service mm. out of respect? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, something else that for me goes right along with this, and it also is related to the preferences conversation is you, in your book, you write, I've also learned the hard way to ask the patient who they would like at the bedside. Sometimes it's a girlfriend rather than the wife. Sometimes it's the same sex partner the family had suspected, but had never really come to grips with. I'll bet you've seen some interesting things in that regard. A absolutely. And the real issue arises, patient does not have full capacity, where competency is the term we typically use, but capacity is the legal term. Patient isn't thinking quite right. In most states, the spouse can speak for the patient. In Minnesota, interestingly, there is not that derivative. Hmm. But common sense would dictate that the spouse would speak for her patient. But I've had circumstances where the same sex partner was a more appropriate spokesperson for the patient. The same sex partner that everybody sort of knew about, but nobody talked about. This was that special friend. So these are the issues that somehow need to be resolved upfront in the light of day not under the glare of the ICU monitor or the emergency room light. Yeah. So if there is the suspicions of those unspoken entanglements, boy, it's best to talk about those over the kitchen table, over a cup of coffee, rather than in the cacophony of an intensive care unit. Yeah, I can, I can imagine. Um, and I'm reminded of something, a, a thinker, you know, a 20th century thinker, Buckminster Fuller. Oh, of course. Talked, right. He talked about how our societies tend to only deal with, with issues once they become emergencies. Right. And, and this idea yes. of emergence by emergency that we develop technology or we change our behavior when it becomes literally a matter of survival and, and not until then, not until the pain is so great. And I think that maybe this is that same tendency showing up in individual lives. Like we won't have that over a cup of coffee or at the kitchen table for whatever reason, but when it becomes essential on the deathbed, okay, now we will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we How can we do that? We have to think ahead. We have to plan at the time of death. Everyone is physically existentially and spiritually exhausted. The tank mm -hmm. is dry. There's nothing left. The brain cells are misfiring. Emotions are raw. Tensions are high. Mm -hmm. So as the patient proceeds down that existential tunnel, that's when somebody needs to invite someone over a cup of coffee and say, let's talk about something. There's something that I'm concerned about. You know, the I statements, non-judgmental, but so that we don't have a disintegration at the bedside I need your guidance about X, Y, or Z. Mm. We can't leave anybody out. Yeah. I, I imagine there are people who are listening to this, who they find themselves in this very circumstance. And you talk about that in your book, that if you're reading this by the bedside, like I've seen you, I know you, right? Like, again, we all go through this at some point or we avoid it. <laughs> but my, the point I'm trying to make is I suspect there that this interview will, people will find it at the moment that they're in this caring for a loved one who's on his or her way out of this world. And they're, they're, they're getting this idea of, okay, I want I'm going to initiate these conversations, but they don't, they still don't know how they, maybe they feel they need some support. Maybe it's a clergy or a coach or a therapist or another, a friend, family friend, or something like that. 
what what advice do you give to somebody who wants to to do this, who wants to initiate these conversations, but doesn't quite know how to do it effectively or safely? In an ideal world, which it's not, well, let me give you an example. There's an acquaintance of mine who's in the dying process now. Prominent real estate person, power broker in a community uh, in an upper Midwestern state. Went through a bitter divorce years ago has two adult daughters and one adult son. He has extensive real estate holdings, including a palatial lakefront estate. There was a meeting around the bedside between the two daughters, the son, and the patient. And the patient said to the son, I want you to have the house. I want you to have the house The other assets I'm going to divide between the sisters. The son was very happy. The other sisters went ballistic, accusing the father of not being fair. So this was a bad scene. A priest was making rounds who knew the patient. And he said, you know, said to the adult children, let's go outside and let's kind of talk about this so that there's no misunderstandings. There was a lot of misunderstandings because a lot of money and property was involved. So the priest had the foresight to act as the mediator in a non-judgmental format. They went back to the bedside and the priest said to the patient, let's be fair about this. You're on your way out. Your energy is gonna become diluted. You need all the purchasing power you need to make this a fair situation. So there was an agreement. We're going to sell the house. We're going to have one big piggy bank and we're to divide it in thirds. Everybody went home feeling good about it. So if the individuals can talk about it among themselves, which they typically cannot, cannot, then there needs to be some detached professional who could say, what I'm hearing doesn't feel right. Maybe we can explore this other opportunity. But if it's not done in the light of day, when people are rested and comfortable, this will be a Holocaust that'll be, um, it'll, it'll scissors the soul of that family forever. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've seen that in different families. So two, two more questions in this section that I, that I want to ask. Uh, one is when one finds oneself in the role of caregiver. Yes, yes. Which, which also can be very depleting. What, what recommendations do you have or what have you seen that works well when it comes to nurturing, managing, caring for oneself in this very trying time? Is this ever timely, Brilliant. Over the last two years, for some reason, this has become a hot button topic, caring for the caregivers. And I suspect I've given maybe a dozen presentations on this. So I looked at some of the data on this, data of which I was not aware. And for the caregivers out there, your life expectancy will be shortened by 10 years. Wow. Your life expectancy will be 10 years shorter because of your caregiving responsibility and the data are out there. 50% five O of caregivers will die before the patient dies. Really? Really. Half of the caregiver community will die before the patient dies. Right now, approximately 30 to 40 million, million individuals are primarily full-time caregivers. Is this 30 to 40 million worldwide or in the United no, States? No, no, USA. Wow. 30 to 40 million are primarily full or partial caregivers. Average age, late 40s primarily caring for elderly parents with Alzheimer's disease. The other dimension of this, of which I was unaware, is the economic catastrophe. 
And the, the, the fictional story is a caregiver who had been making about $80,000 a year, which is a high-end salary. Mm-hmm. If she's out of the workforce for two years because of caregiving, she will have lost $200,000, almost a quarter of a million that she will never recoup. Wow. Wow. So that talks about some numbers. Let's talk about the health consequences. Dr. Judith Cower, K-O-U-R, a beloved colleague, was at Mayo Clinic for several decades, At now is at Mayo Clinic in Florida, a marvelous hospice colleague. She's almost like a Mother Teresa. She saw, as we all see, the implications of caregiving, what it does. So she did a study measuring immunological markers in the blood of caregivers. And their immune system basically is paralyzed and goes south. And they are a tremendous risk for colds, for the flu, connective tissue disorders, and depression. But let me tell you the rest of it. I would ask all of our listeners to take off their shoes and take out your shoelaces. And if you take out your shoelace, there's that plastic thing on the end of your shoelace, you know, that you put into the eye hole. And genetically, these are called telomeres, T-E-L-O-M-E-R-E-S, telomeres. Your telomere has a certain length. Let's suppose your telomere is this big. With stress of caregiving, whether it's for the elderly or for children with disabilities, your telomere shrinks. The shorter the telomere, the shorter your life. So we have objective evidence that caregiving can be deadly. So what do we do about it? Number one, if you don't take care of yourself, there's no backup. There's nobody left to take care of your spouse, your neighbor, your friend, or your partner. So this is not an indulgence. This is a prominent characteristic that you must do. You must have time away. You must have time away. In the state of, in our community is a program called Visiting Angels who are wonderful. At a minimum, caregivers need eight to 12 hours away from caregiving or they will not go the distance. And this is eight to 12 hours for every day of caregiving? No, or? typically eight to 12 hours a week. Oh, eight to 12 hours a week a away week. just doing their own Absolutely. Self-care. So this yeah. might be three half days a week. That'd be 12 hours. Yeah. Because caregivers become fatigued. Their cognitive power nosedives. Their judgment nosedives. They cannot make decisions. Bills don't get paid. And if they're not technically savvy to begin with, they lose that ability to stay connected. They cannot not access patient portals. Uh, you know, most of us, you know, are real familiar with the tablet, the cell phone, but there's a lot of folks out there that have no idea what they think it's a big coaster. Yeah. And if one isn't used to getting online, making appointments, see what the doctor said, What's the medication that I had? They become overwhelmed. And to stand in a big box store for two hours doesn't make any sense when they can get on a patient portal and have the medication delivered home. Yeah. So caregiving is a lethal profession, which has tremendous implications for society and for families. Right now, there are data from the University of Michigan. Someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia every 72 seconds. Wow. Seconds. Rochester, Minnesota has one of the most robust demographic studies in the world of aging because all of the care in Olmsted County is given in one of two organizations, Mayo Clinic or the Olmsted Medical Group. So everyone has a unified medical record. So we can follow individuals from birth 
through death. We know everything about them. There's no study like this in the world. This is a human Petri dish. And we know that starting at about age 80 or 85, at least half of the population has some element of cognitive impairment, mm. at least half. So your insights about caregiving is so insightful. This is a tsunami coming down the pike and nobody is ready for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's un unprecedented, right? With our aging population and, and all the other uh, just what we're facing in, in, in life right now, yes. <laughs> there's so much that, that we haven't been exposed to. So looking ahead can be so good. Well, thank you for, for sharing that. One thing I also want to be sure to talk to you about, because I understand you're a pioneer in this is palliative care. Yes. What is, and my hope selfishly is that people will learn about it and go into it, <laughs> go into this as a career. But will you tell me what is palliative care and, and how and when and why did you get involved? Brilliant. Every one of our listeners really needs to pay attention right now. Mm. Okay. Turn off the television, turn off the ironing. <laughs> uh, don't look at the news and please pay attention to this. In the middle 1990s, I had been on staff at Mayo Clinic for about 20 winters. That's how we measure things in Minnesota. I had been an oncologist for 20 years. And I became struck, as did many of my colleagues, about the toxicities of our chemotherapy programs. And every one of our listeners has a litany of experiences of misery from chemotherapy. We're much better now, but in the 1990s, this was not a, a good gig, so to speak. So I became curious, how do I learn about this? Because like most doctors, I thought I knew everything. I thought I didn't need the internet, I'm a smart guy. So I started to go to hospice meetings. These were wonderful. They talked about practical interventions to improve the quality of life, morphine, stool softeners, medicines for pain, anxiety, but most importantly, to sit down with the patient and the family, eye to eye, and talk about where this train is going, and to ask one question, what can I do for you? So in 1996, I had a near-death experience. In March, we were in the middle of a blizzard, and I was driving from Rochester, Minnesota, in the southern part of the state, 100 miles to the equivalent of Siberia to get to Minneapolis, 20 below zero, horizontal sleet. The car did a 360. Now, I'm a bright guy. I thought, you know, this is not going to have a happy ending. I could go home and not take the exam, or I could go forward and take the exam. I made the decision to push on, the blizzard stopped, and I passed the exam. So I had credibility. Then I took the exam a few years later, and then a few years after that. So in medicine, we live in the land of credentials. So I had the credentials about dealing with death and dying. So for our listeners, they need to understand palliative care. You can think of palliative care as a big basketball, as a big basketball, and it focuses on quality of life and sense of well being, regardless of the diagnosis. Lord forbid you have a heart attack, you have nausea and vomiting, and your feet hurt. The last thing the cardiologist wants to do is to hear about your nausea, your vomiting, and your feet. The palliative care people come in and they focus on your symptoms. I focus on the symptoms, the heart people focus on the heart. When it comes to cancer, the oncologist or the hematologist focuses on your cancer, leukemia, breast cancer. The palliative care people focus on your nausea, your vomiting, your diseases of the soul, so we get pretty good at what we get pretty good at. So 
The big basketball is palliative care. A sliver of that, a sliver is hospice. By definition, hospice supplies to end of life care during a patient's last six months of life. Simple question. Is it likely that Mr. Jones or Mrs. Smith will pass away in six months? If the answer is yes, they are hospice eligible. Now there's a few subtleties there, but this is a gift from the feds. Simplistically, that the hospice benefit covers financially expenses related to your end of life. This might be a walker, might be crutches, canes. It might be physical therapy coming into the home, might be a nutritionist, might be music therapy. It's an incredible gift to make those six months better for you, the patient, and for the family. Now, there's two dimensions, bricks and mortar. All of our listeners know about this, hospice of whatever, or there's a hospice which is home-based, which typically means that there is a capable caregiver in the home. Now, not necessarily, it's not a deal breaker, but ideally, if I'm a hospice candidate, my wife would be uh, available to help. But every family needs to raise the issue to the primary care people. Let's run this by the hospice team. Let's run this by the palliative care team. In general, no one in the world really understands this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've, I've heard many people talk about how, you know, when they're patients, they often feel like a diagnosis and that, oh. the, right. The doctors are treating the disease, but they're, they're forgetting them as a person. Right. And this, this palliative uh, approach, and it seems to be a very team approach uh, is something that I think many people, like you're saying, they're not aware of, but if they were, it would literally transform their experience, their end of life experience. Oh. And like, who doesn't want that for themselves and those they love? But I should assure our audiences that we did not rehearse this, but <laughs> you have eloquently summarized this. Most of our listeners have care under a complex health system computer called EPIC, E-P-I-C. Just mention those four words to any physician. They will grab their chest and bend over, weeping visibly, because it's complicated and it's very difficult to find out the patient's occupation. How can we knock on the door, minister to someone, and not know what they do? Yeah. I also include the name of the patient's pet. Hmm. And in a charged end of life environment, and you ask patients, who do you live with? And I say, my wife, my spouse, my partner, anybody else? Oh, yes, I live with Jesse. Who's Jesse? Jesse's a golden retriever. Nobody can talk about Jesse without smiling or without some story about their golden retriever. So the calculus, I sound like a Harvard business person, the optics yeah. change completely. Yeah. And, and like you were saying earlier, the, these issues of faith and belief and preferences that, that I think can easily be forgotten when it's, hey, I've got to eliminate you know, this disease, and, but I'm not seeing you as a yeah. person or the, the, the environment. Yeah. That you li that you yeah. live in the space that you occupy spiritually, emotionally, mentally. Yeah. But let me share with you two stories. Walked into the room and saw a gentleman who was in his early nineties, bad clinical situation, far advanced lung cancer. He was alone. He had the stigmata of advanced cancer, and sp sprinkled throughout the history was the word PhD, but it never explained what he was a PhD of. And I said, Dr. So-and-so, I see you're a PhD. Can you tell me what you did? And he said, son, call me son, said, he said, have you ever heard of the Manhattan Project, Los Alamos, the Enola Gay and J. Robert Oppenheimer? I said, sure. That all related to the atom bomb. The Enola Gay was the name of the plane that dropped the atom bomb. This gentleman was the chief physicist 
for the atom bomb project. No one understood his place in history. Hmm. All of a sudden, he was not just an old man with lung cancer. He was a man who was a factor in transforming the gyroscope of the human race wow. for which he was tremendously guilty. Another gentleman was dying with a serious problem, intensive care unit, four daughters at the bedside. Daughters were probably early fifties. And I asked the gentleman, what did you do? And he went like this. Oh, and the daughter said, Dr. Cragen, do you eat pizza? And I thought, oh, here it comes. I said, sure. How did you cut your pizza? I said, with one of those circular knives. My dad, the patient, invented the circular knife. Wow. So those are the, the nuggets that bring us back to the bedside during very difficult times. So every time I cut a pizza, I think of this gentleman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Well, Dr. Ed, with your permission, I want to go ahead and transition us now to the enlightening lightning route. Yes, sure. Okay. Um, and by the way, how are you doing? Oh, I'm very durable. Good. Yeah, okay. un unflappable. Awesome. All right. So again, this is a series of questions on a variety of topics. Yes. Yes. Um, my aim is to ask the question and for the most part to stand aside. You're welcome to answer as long as you want, but sure. Good. Okay. Question number one. Yes. Please complete the following question. Okay. I'm sorry. Please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. Sure. Life is like a chess game. Okay. Number two here. I'm borrowing Peter Thiel's question. Yes. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? There's no free lunch. <laughs> okay. Number three. <laughs> If you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it or a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? Make me feel important. Mm. All right. Question number four, what book other than one of your own have you gifted or recommended most often? The Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell. Okay. Uh, and what are you currently reading? I've often been accused I only read what I write. But as a distance runner, I have to talk about hyper-focus. This book was part of your website. Oh, yeah. And it talks about the importance of time management. But I also, in, in the midst of finishing, whoops, the sports gene. Oh, yes. Bottom line, there is no gene for greatness. You mm. got to hustle. You got to get up in the morning. You have to do the work. There is no spin of your DNA that's going to bring you to the NBA finals or to Carnegie Hall. It's yeah. gut busting work. There's no free lunch. There's no easy road to become very, very good. Yeah. You know, that well said. And that is a thought for me that simultaneously like liberating and depressing, <laughs> you know, I, but, but really, I think also it's a cop out. If you say, Greatness is a genetic trait, and I'm not great. That gets me off the hook because I could say I don't have that spin of DNA. Yeah. But if you look behind every great person, there is a family, there's a tribe, there's a community, there's a confluence of factors. It yeah. didn't happen just by luck. Yeah, for sure. All right. Thank you for that. Okay. Question number five. Yes. So you traveled a lot yes. in your lifetime. What is one travel hack, meaning? What's something you do or something you take with you when you travel to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? You must take a list, a non-negotiable list of the minimal stuff you can take. Mm. And on that list, you better have a passport, baby. You may think you're famous. Immigration doesn't care. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay. Question number six. What's something you've started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? Watching the news on a regular basis and pruning, limiting any social media exposure. Mm, you've, you've stopped that. You've stopped looking at the news. I will, I will spend a minimum of time, about four nanoseconds, yeah. becoming familiar 
with what's going on, but I will not waste my time with the entertainment of cable news. I will not waste my time following someone on the internet or on social media. It's mm -hmm. corrosive. It's negative. It's not good for the spirit. And frankly, an hour later, you've burned through 60 minutes. You have nothing to show for it. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny that you bring that up right now as well, because over to about the last six days, almost a full week, I just said, I'm going to quit looking at the news on my phone. Y yes, yes. And I, my days have been so much better at the end of the day. Yes, I yes. I just feel better. <laughs> yeah. No rebuttal. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Question number seven. What's one thing you wish every American knew? The limitations of medicine and the importance of self-care and ownership. Hmm. Me too. And by the way, uh, for people to learn more about that in a concise and highly readable way, I invite them to pick up your other book, How Not to Be My Patient, A Physician's Secrets for Staying Healthy and Surviving Any Diagnosis. Thank you. Much like me going to an estate lawyer or copyright people, I don't know the vocabulary. I don't know the landscape. I don't know the vineyard. And 80 to 90% of illnesses, of reasons why people seek care, are due to lifestyle options and lifestyle choices. Yeah. Genetics plays a very, very small role. Let me give you an example. I'm an only child. Someone said, well, don't you have any brothers or sisters? Well, no, by definition, I don't. <laughs> Each of my parents really struggle with alcoholism, big time. What's the probability of me as an only son having inherited the gene or the tendency towards alcoholism? Probably 100%. So when I was probably 15, 16 years old, a light bulb went on. It's not worth the risk, no alcohol, no problem. So we are not prisoners of our genetic endowment. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's powerful. Um, yeah, there was something I wanted to add or ask, but maybe I'll recall that. Yeah, thank you for, thank you for sharing that. Um, okay. Okay. Keep us moving. Question number eight. Yes. What's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about making relationships work? Listen. Listen. Mm -hmm. As they're talking, don't be thinking about what you want to do. As I mentioned earlier, the t-shirt, make me feel important. Everybody has a sweatband. Make me feel important. So when I speak, used to be face-to-face, -face, but now more virtual, make me feel important, make my day count. What most people are doing, they're thinking ahead to the next question. And don't try to one up someone. They're talking about some serious medical problem they have. Don't say that you have the worst pain in the world. Simply listen, you will have a friend for life. Oh, thank you. And by the way, I do think that uh, it's worth acknowledging the the length of your marriage uh, you've been together you, i heard you say best friend oh i i am so blessed my wife is peggy menzel she is a german dietitian that's why i look like this but we'll celebrate our 21st anniversary next october but the point is without a pole star mm -hmm. without that gps person spouse partner relationship colleague neighbor who do you call at four o'clock in the morning? If you're isolated, if you're marginal, if you're on the margins, the track record is not good. Yeah. So I think, especially now, we're in a digital world. We have the COVID thing. Um, we will have enforced isolation probably for the next year. It might be loosened up a bit. But I think those communal gatherings, that quick dinner, that impulsive theater, it's not going to happen, especially yeah. with the evolution of the mutant strains. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of unknowns still. Yes. Yes. You know, just going back for a moment, the thing that I, when you were sharing about lifestyle choices was this was only a few years ago that I had the insight. Like it was one of my, one of my teachers pointed out that aging doesn't necessarily mean 
like break down into decrepitude. Now, obviously we lose faculties and things like this, but I had always just imagined like illness and disease was a necessary and inescapable mm -hmm. part of aging. And what this teacher pointed out was you can just ripen and then expire. <laughs> and I'd never known that. I, I think the classic example is Dr. Anthony Fauci. He's 80 years old. Just think for a moment, the pressures, the tensions, the conflicts, the visibility, the threats yeah. that he and his wife and I think two daughters were under during this unspeakable nightmare. He knew what needed to be done. He had the science, he had the credentials, and yet for complex reasons that we may never really understand, he could not articulate that message. And to me, he has now been liberated and there's a lightness in him. Yeah. So he's an example of an inhabitant of the blue zone. Mm. For our listeners, the blue zones are those parts of the world where, where people far live in excess of your typical suburban executive. Yeah. And it's, as you were saying, it's not genetic. It's not just no. genetic. It's so. friends, family. It's colleagues, it's challenges, it's being acknowledged for your insights and wisdom. Our elderly today are warehoused mm -hmm. in Azerbaijan, in Loma Linda, in the country of Georgia, in certain parts of South America, in Okinawa, people are acknowledged for their elderly skills. In our country, that's not the case. Yeah, that as a phrase, I mean, it's very descriptive and it, it brings something up in me about warehousing the elderly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then in your book, How Not to Be My Patient, you talk about the only true fountain of youth, exercise. Right. <laughs> uh, I know we're being recorded, so I won't become too profane, but yeah, it's not at some spa in some uh, sunbelt. <laughs> yeah. It's not infusions of certain Please. Yeah, things. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. Question number Nine. Yes. Aside from compound interest, what's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about money? Invest the same amount month after month or week after week, and don't look at the Dow, the S and P, and the Nasdaq. Mm. Yeah, my dad would have liked that. He would have. Uh, he might have phrased it, "Don't be a short timer." <laughs> like have that right. long term view. And there's a company out there that some of our listeners are aware of that sold video games. And this has become the poster child of um, rolling the dice and it has really jeopardized uh, conventional financial wisdom. Remember, uh, Warren Buffett made a comment, never invest in anything that you cannot describe or explain to a friend or neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. Solid. Okay. So the last part of our conversation, I have just a few questions for you about writing and your creative process. But before we, before we get to that, um, I want to be sure to ask two things. One is I want to be sure to let you know that as an expression of gratitude to you for sharing so generously of your time and in your experience, uh, one of the things I've done is I've gone on Kiva.org, a yes. micro lending site that helps uh, underserved entrepreneurs around the world. And I've made a $100 micro loan to a group of women in Senegal who yes. are raising uh, crops and they will sell these to support themselves and improve the quality of life in their community. So thank you for giving me a reason. Well, well to do thank that. you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing, the other question here is if people want to learn more from you or they want to connect with you, what would you have them do? Our website is askdred.com, A S K D O C T O R. Uh, DrEd.com. And let me share my email address. And that's Cragen, C R E A G A N, dot Edward at gmail.com. Because our listeners are survivors, they're resilient, they're durable, or they wouldn't have the psychic strength to listen to this. Yeah. And they've learned wisdom, they've learned insights that I would like to hear to pass on to other travelers because there's no website, there's no planet that has the solutions. And sometimes we learn nuggets of survival from the 
uh, least likely sources. So we just need to pay attention and, and be alert. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Well, thank you. Okay. And the final part of our conversation here today is, uh, as I mentioned, about writing and creativity. Yes. And uh, one of the things I'm, I'm constantly fascinated by is this idea that many people are good at what they do, but they're not necessarily good at teaching about <laughs> what they do. And they're not necessarily good about communicating or writing. Yes, yes. But, but I think you are. And I wonder, when did you first know yourself to be a writer or when did you first get the desire to write? This was in medical school which quite frankly, I went to, I graduated from medical school in 1970. And to be very honest, it was a miserable soul shredding experience. I'm being very honest. This was medical school in New York City. And we've all heard these stories and they're true. First day of medical school, we were in a large auditorium, almost like a warehouse. There was 120 of us and the doors opened and about 20 colleagues came in who thought they were entering year two of medical school. Their grades were reevaluated and they had to repeat the first year of medical school. Wow. Merry Christmas. Welcome aboard. Oh, my goodness. So it was, it was a bitter experience. And the lectures were dreadful. They would have some Nobel laureate droning on incomprehensibly about something that made no sense whatsoever. And I would say to myself, gee, I can do better than this. So that led me think about writing. Mm. And, and I learned I would come in from a run because I've run all my life. And off the top of my head, I was able to write between one and 3000 words on any topic. This is like someone in a bar who can sit down and play, take me out to the ball game without any sheet music. So now I have a software gimmick called fluency direct. So I would come in from a run like we did this morning, sit down and dictate about 2000 words on the next book, the next blog, the next column. Where this comes from, I don't know, but it's a gift for which I am profoundly grateful. And most of the topics come from some mundane observation, some thought that goes through my mind. Yeah, and part of what I've enjoyed about your writing is that it does include stories and it makes it more enjoyable for me to read. It makes it more relevant, you know, I can relate to, I haven't been through, you know, many of those things, thank goodness, <laughs> but I find them fascinating and so forth. One thing I, I'd love to know is, as you have these decades of experience and you've collected these stories, how do you organize them? How do you organize a book? And then how do you slot in stories? Okay. The crucial aspect of writing any book is firstly to ask yourself, who's the audience? Who cares about this particular book? Mm -hmm. The second most important thing is to have an outline of chapters. Let's suppose I was writing a book about automobile maintenance. So each chapter might be a book about the car. Here's the steering wheel. Here's the carburetor. Here's the transmission. Here's the electrical system, something like that. Every chapter must have a story. People do not remember facts and figures. And if you look at the cable news, it's all based on stories. There might be some facts and figures, some slick graph or chart, but the basics are the human interest stories. And look at the stories that we all remember of what happened in the Capitol a couple of weeks ago, the terror, the anxiety, the life altering, potentially lethal implications. So there has to be a story, but equally importantly, you must have an editor. You must have an editor. I've been blessed to work with one of the finest editors in the world, Sandy Wendell from Omaha. And she has a website, Write on Inc., W-R-I-T-E, because we develop myopia. We develop cataracts as we put together a book. And you need someone to say, you know, you're sitting on the next Harry Potter and you don't know it. 
Let me give you an example. One of the most iconic transcendent cardiac surgeons in the world, I'm being serious about this, is at Mayo Clinic, has transplanted more hearts and dealt with more children with lethal heart conditions than any performer in any institution. He's a sacred personality. He's also a saxophonist. I'm a pianist. Why anybody would play the horn, I don't know, but I respect his skills and he's good. And he had an idea for a book melding the concept of the surgeon and the leader in the operating room and a musician and an orchestra conductor. Frankly, I couldn't get real excited about this. Now, maybe there are business people that would, but frankly, this was not something high on my list. But I didn't want to shut the door. I referred him to Sandy, the editor, and maybe she says something here. She can tease out the value of this. But we ourselves don't have the gift to see beyond ourselves to see the real value of a potential book. Yeah. Yeah, that's often the case, right? Either because we get so attached to something and we over we overvalue or overestimate how valuable it is. Yes. Or, or we don't see. I think this is something that people who are very good at what they do, very smart, very talented, they often, because their gifts come so easily to them, they don't know how special their own gift really is. Yeah, yeah. So it's but funny I, that happens I, I, both ways. I think that really applies to golf. It also applies to pianists. You have mm-hmm. three platforms of pianists. You have the composers, you have the performers, and you have the teachers. Mm -hmm. very little overlap. You have the composers, you have the performers and the teachers. Same is true in golf. If you look at the top money work winners on the PGA tour, none of them are teachers. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, the swing coaches and the conditioning coaches in golf, none of them have had a prominence on the PGA tour, except as teachers. So it's, it's the remarkable person that has a gift that they can teach and they can also have visibility in. Yeah, for sure. That's an interesting distinction. I've never thought of it that way. So if in music, it's the composers, the performers, and the teachers. Yes. What is it in golf? Is it the coaches? The- yes. If, if you look at the top money work winners on the PGA Tour, uh-huh. everyone has a private swing coach. This is almost a sports psychologist who Mm -hmm. clearly has a visibility in golf. I'm thinking of uh, Tom Harmon uh, had been a prominent teacher. I'm thinking of uh, Tiger Woods and his first teacher was his father, Earl. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the top money winners on the PGA tour, everyone without exception on speed dial has a coach, a swing coach who is reimbursed for looking at the player's style. Mm -hmm. Perfect example. I spoke at a nice venue in Scottsdale a couple of years ago, and there was a tent. And in the tent was one of the most spectacular young golfers I had ever seen in my life. I'm guessing 16 or 18 years of age. She had two swing coaches and each of them had a tablet. Whoops. Each of them had a tablet. One was taping her from the back, One was taping her from the side. Then these were on tripods. Then they sat down in the tent where it was cool. She had water and towels and they went over the video of her swing. So here we had an example of someone who was talented, but had the environment and the expertise to bring her to the next level. Mm -hmm. If she was not a person of prominence and a person of possibilities, she would never achieve greatness. Yeah. So it, what's the, so if we have the performance, that's that's one, we have the teacher, but what's the equivalent of composer when it comes to something like golf? This was someone who would only write, uh, for example, Irving Berlin Mm. couldn't put two consecutive notes together, but he was Mm. a composer par excellence. Mm. Interesting. Uh, If you look at, at Mozart, tremendous composer, but certainly was not well known as a player. Chopin only had probably uh, 
five or 10 concerts, but he was good at what he did. Wow. I've been with the same piano teacher, oh, for almost 17 years, brilliant teacher, points out things to me I wouldn't see in a year, but is not comfortable performing in public. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Awesome. What advice or encouragement would you give to someone who's either in the middle of writing their own book project, or it's something that's like a dream they've harbored for a long time, but they haven't yet begun? What advice or encouragement do you give to that Every person? day without exception, you get a, a yellow legal tab or whatever mm -hmm. and write down a thousand words. Mm -hmm. This is non-negotiable. This is not optional. They could be bombing Salt Lake City. Some third world country is invading Los Angeles. I don't care. I set my smartphone for one hour, one hour a day, and I either dictate or fine tune so I would say to that author, don't let anybody discourage you. Uh, we all remember the Harry Potter story, J.K. Rowling. And for the listeners who may not know it, she was a single mom in, I believe, Glasgow. She was raising her daughter by herself. She had no hope. She had no options. But every day she sat down in a booth and wrote Harry Potter. She used the initials J.K., because of the prejudice against women authors at that time in the UK. She didn't want them to know she was a woman. Mm -hmm. And I believe 22 authors basically said, who cares about witches and goblins and who cares about Hogwarts? And Harry Potter obviously changed everything. However, mm -hmm. as we touched on earlier, there is a price for greatness. Mm -hmm. And she's been very public about her depression, and, and some, some emotional issues. So one needs to be careful about seeking the key to the kingdom because it also may be the key to your demise. Mm. Yeah. Very what? difficult to be young and talented. Yeah, absolutely. Every, uh, every gift contains a curse perhaps and vice versa. <laughs> Yes, um, I'm, I'm thinking of the Faustian bargain. Basically, for our listeners, you make a bargain with the devil. If you give me the magic of whatever, I will give you my soul. But the magic of whatever may be the magic of, of, of your demise. Yeah. What have you learned about marketing and promoting books? Marketing and promoting books is very much analogous to the music industry. For every great author and every great musician, there are thousands, thousands struggling emotionally and financially. Mm. And we don't know in general all about marketing and promotion. That's where you need an agent or a publicist or an editor who knows how the industry works. For example, I learned before COVID that something like 85% of all book purchases are within the first seven feet of the store. 90% hmm. of all book purchases are impulsive. 95% of book purchases are fiction. Hmm. This went against my basic DNA. I, I would not have imagined that. Hmm. A key to a book which I can't quickly put my finger on is to have the author's picture on the cover or a picture like this. You have the athlete. Mm -hmm. So here's our book, how not to be my patient. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This cover took seven hours of preparation, mm -hmm. seven hours, my picture, and it was carefully manicured, no Photoshop. So the warts of the wrinkle show the word not is there. Mm -hmm. Also, my credentials. So people see this, but they also see that there was a foreword by Dr. Sanjay Gupta. And he says, this book is for everyone who decides to take charge of their own health and their own destiny. Now, I knew nothing about marketing. Same with Par Farewell, that uh, Dr. Deepak Chopra wrote the introduction and also the dust jacket. So these are things I was clueless about. And that's why we rely on other experts to handle that sort of stuff. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing I've been uh, struck by repeatedly is how writing and publishing a book and marketing a book really is a collaborative effort. Yes. Yes. It's not a, not a solo endeavor as much as we might think of a writer as a really solitary yeah. pro. Uh, and, and I think each of our, us as writers need to have some street smart savviness about the book industry and how it works. You know, the days of uh, putting your book in a bookstore are, are somewhat irrelevant, except for the John Grishams and the Danielle Steeles and those folks. Uh, most authors would self-publish. Uh, with the help of my wonderful uh, editor, Sandy Wendell, I've learned that, uh, that e-books are the way of the future and also podcasts. Yeah. And the concept of having uh, 15 tons of books in my garage just doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Awesome. All right. Well, Dr. Ed, I've learned so much and I've enjoyed our conversation very much. I know we've, we've spoken for nearly two hours and we've covered a lot of ground, but as a final, maybe as a final thought, what, what advice or encouragement would you leave those listening with, whether it's related to writing or life or end of life or anything? Never let anybody tell you that there's something you cannot do. Mm -hmm. Be so good that they can't ignore you. Because regardless of who we are or where we live, one roadblock after another will be put in your way. And I'll give you an example. About 20 years ago, I started to write a mom and pop column for the Cedar Rapids Gazette, and it also periodically appeared in the Minneapolis Star Tribune. So this was mom and pop stuff, nothing political, get a cat, stop whining, get the bed early, exercise, eat like a rabbit because you see no rabbits in hospitals, you know, kind of basic stuff. Uh -huh. And it was kind of nice to be recognized. And I became sort of called the, uh, oh, sort of the Mark Twain of Iowa. And then Sandy Wendell, the woman who had been with for many years, my editor, called me up. And I still remember the day I was in a hallway about to see a patient. And you didn't know her at this no, time? No, never, never heard of her. So she called me up and I said, gee, let me call you back because I'm going to see a patient. And she said, do you know you're sitting on a couple of bestsellers? Wow. I said, give me a break. Um, but I tried to be polite. And I said, well, let's tell me about this. She said, yeah. well, I've looked at a couple of hundred of your columns. You've probably put together a couple of thousand words. I think we could work together. So we put together the first edition of this. And being a good corporate soldier, I went through all of our various committees, brand management, communications, public relations, administration, et cetera, et cetera. And each of them said, who would care about these stories? Who would care that your parents struggle with alcoholism? Who would care that you spent a lot of time shooting pool, going to the racetrack and playing chess. Who would really care that, you know, you, you were the president of one of the premier medical institutions in the world. Uh, why don't you just do your thing? We, we don't really have much interest in this. And I was very willing to give them the copyright and all that sort of stuff about which I knew nothing. So these various committees said, okay, you do your book thing. Well, to my amazement, this became one of the top bestsellers on Amazon. It was nominated for the Book of the Year Award. And then the second version had even more popularity. And it's been translated into probably five or six different languages, including uh, Spanish and also Italian. Oh. So if I had walked off onto the sunset, none of this would have happened. So... When we put farewell together, I sort of had the same reaction. These books are a dime a dozen, but there is no other author that heard 40,000 bedside discussions. And our book was even purchased for copyright by the People's Republic of China. Wow. So my message to the rank and file is that no one will acknowledge that you're on the road 
to hitting that home run. Be street smart, be savvy, be aware, but by all means, bring to the table individuals who know how to play the game. You're good at one thing, but that expertise may not be transferable. Rely on some people to do what they do and you do what you do. Well, Dr. Ed, thank you again for, for sharing so generously in this interview. I'm really, I'm really glad we connected. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to staying connected. I'm looking, I know you've got more books <laughs> in you, I can tell. So I'm looking forward to that. And maybe well, we'll do this again with the next one. Hey, thanks so much for listening to this episode of the School for Good Living podcast. Before you take off, I just want to extend an invitation to you. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life still isn't working for many people. Whether it's here in the developed world where we deal with depression, anxiety, loneliness, addiction, divorce, unfulfilling jobs or relationships that don't work, or in the developing world where so many people still don't have access to basic things like clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education, or they live in conflict zones, there are a lot of people on this planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, or even if your life is working, but you have the sense that it could work better, consider signing up for the School for Good Living's Transformational Coaching Program. It's something I've designed to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated, or you've gone through a divorce, or you've gotten married, headed into retirement, starting a business, been married for a long time, whatever. No matter where you are in life, this nine-month program will give you the opportunity to go deep in every area of your life, to explore life's big questions, to create answers for yourself, in a community of other growth-minded individuals. And it can help you get clarity and be accountable to realize more of your unrealized potential can also help you find and maintain motivation. In short, it's designed to help you live with greater health, happiness, and meaning so that you can be, do, have, and give more. Visit goodliving.com to learn more or to sign up today.